I'm Sarah Kessens. I am currently a research fellow in the College of Science. And from January, I'm going to be a lecturer in the College of Engineering, uh, working in the School of Product Design. As you may be able to tell from my accent, I'm not a native Kiwi. Um, I came here to New Zealand and, and Christchurch seven years ago uh, for a two-year postdoc and uh, fell in love with the country. And I, I've managed not to get myself kicked out here yet. Uh, my background is actually in plant biology and molecular biology, so I have a, a degree, a uh, Bachelor of Science from uh, Purdue University, and so I have a PhD from Arizona State in, uh, in plant molecular biology. Um, for the last couple years, I've been working with uh, some really good teams uh, in collaboration with University of Canterbury, Victoria University, uh, Massey University, and Callahan Innovation. And uh, my, my research here for the last couple years has been on filamentous fungi, which are sort of like the molds that grow on your bread. How many of you have you know, reached into the cupboard and, and got out some moldy bread? Yeah? <laughs> um, actually, that moldy bread can actually be uh, quite useful. That moldy bread produces a lot of really amazing compounds. Um, if you guys have heard of the, the fungi called uh, penicillium, any, any guess what the, the fungi penicillium might make? Any? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So, so different molds are, are involved in, uh, in uh, the flavors in cheese and things like Roquefort and, and blue cheese. Um, but they produce also, in, in, in addition to flavors, a lot of really other cool secondary, secondary metabolites like antibiotics. So penicillin originally came from penicillium, which is one of the fungi that I actually work with. Um, so what my research is, is sort of focused on is looking at how these fungi make these secondary metabolites. So they produce all sorts of really cool compounds that can be used as antibiotics, insecticides, anti-cancer agents, all sorts of amazing compounds. Um, and all these fungi can do it just, just inside the organisms themselves. As, as humans, for us to make really complex chemicals, it takes a lot of lab work, uh, lots and lots of steps, lots of fancy, heavy equipment, um, and, and lots and lots of steps and lots and lots of people. Um, but the fungi can make these really cool secondary, secondary metabolites just in, within the organism. So what I've been doing here for the last couple years uh, is trying to understand how those fungi make the different compounds inside the cell. So looking at the biosynthetic pathways um, and looking at the, the cellular machinery that makes these cool compounds. Which doesn't seem like it really has anything to do with space, right? Um, I'm thinking maybe if, if any of you have, have come here from uh, understanding sort of what this talk is about, is, is about biology and space, um, it doesn't really seem like a plant biologist and a, and a fungal uh, biochemist is really going to be working in space. How many of you would have ever thought that we could sort of combine both, both space and biology? Ex yes, yes, yes. How many of you guys have, have either seen or read The Martian? Excellent. That is, that is one of my favorite books, one of my favorite films. Um, and absolutely, if, if given the chance, I would 110% uh, love to be able to, to grow either potatoes or really anything else. For me, filamentous fungi uh, on Mars. Um, but when we, when we think of space technologies, what do, we, what do we typically think of when we think of space technologies? Rockets. Yeah. It's kind of a, a big one here in New Zealand. Robots. We, yeah, robots are another one. How about, what else? Satellites? Yeah. By chance? Have, have any of you guys in the audience, do you think you've benefited from space technology? Yep. How many of you have used your phone uh, and the GPS on your phone to, to get around today or in the last couple of days? Absolutely. That's, that's thanks to, to GPS technology. Getting us around here in Christchurch, around in New Zealand, um, helping first responders and emergency crews get to, get to people and find out exactly where, uh, where injured parties might be. Um, satellites have a whole host of really cool things that we can do. Uh, New Zealand has actually just invested in our first uh, space mission, uh, which is methane set. And we're actually looking at detecting methane uh, in both agricultural and industrial uses to try to understand uh, where our pollution is coming for, for greenhouse gases. Uh, we can also use satellites for uh, looking at our crops, uh, finding out better ways to, to detect either diseases or stresses in our crops. So again, another big important one here in New Zealand. Um, and then also a really fun one that some of my friends are working on is, uh, is tracking penguins across Antarctica. Right? So you can do that with planes, but it's, it's quite difficult to do. Um, but you can actually use satellite technology to track penguins 
across Antarctica, and I just think that's one of the coolest things that we can do uh, with space technology. And that's just satellites. There's all sorts of space technologies that we use every day um, that we don't even know uh, are, are basically because of space exploration. So how many of you guys have heard of Teflon? Yep. Did you guys know that that was developed for space? Right? So the, the non-stick in our pans was actually developed for a, a space technology, and a lot of people sort of know that one. Um, but there's also scratch-resistant lenses, um, which is important for, for things like Sunnies and our cell phones. There's actually polymers that have been developed for space technologies um, that we're using now uh, in, our, in our technology here on Earth. Um, flame retardant uh, polymers in firefighting suits. There's just a whole host of different materials that we've been using uh, that were developed for space technology. And then when we're working in space, we want to be as efficient as possible and, uh, and sort of as small as possible. So actually, one of the first laptops was actually developed for space. It wasn't used you know, for, for business people walking around here in Christchurch so they could carry their work with them. It was actually developed uh, so researchers could do, could do things in space. Um, so lots of robotics. Um, how many of you guys have seen pictures or, or videos of, uh, of Curiosity and some of the rovers going around Mars? Right? So we obviously had to develop quite a bit of robot technology to, to be able to do that. Um, so lots and lots of space technology that was developed um, basically just, just for space, but then has, uh, um, has sort of uh, uses here on Earth as well. So getting back to biology, right? So first I talked about biology, and then I talked about space. But how about bringing those things together? Again, some of you guys raised your hands to think about ways that we might be able to bring space and biology together. Um, so I've got a, a massive passion for both biology and space, and I've been really lucky here in the last couple years to be able to try to combine these two things. Um, so working with space and biology sort of for me has two important reasons why we need to do this. Um, one is that we'll, be, we'll eventually become a multi-planetary species, right? How many of you guys would love to go to Mars? <laughs> or potentially live on Mars, yeah? Um, I, I would love to go, I do, I do want to come back. Um, but we're an exploring species, right? That's, that's the, in our human nature. You know, we've, we've basically, we've, we've evolved you know, out of Africa, out of the savannas, we've developed the, the tools and the social skills to populate the entire globe, and eventually we will be populating other planets as well. But the technology that we develop to get us to other planets isn't going to be of any use to us if we can't actually stay alive while we're there. And so that's one of the reasons why I think space biology is really important. How do we actually grow things in space? Right? So humans are really fragile creatures. You know, we can send rovers to Mars, but sending humans to Mars is quite difficult because you need to, to keep them alive and mostly you need to feed them and keep them healthy. Right? So how do we actually grow the things that we're going to eat and to grow the pharmaceuticals uh, that we're actually going to need while we're in space? And so that's one of the things that we're starting to look at is how can we actually develop organisms that can survive in space and can survive in very small, resource-limited uh, containers like either the, the International Space Station or the Lunar Gateway, or eventually when we have colonies on the Moon and Mars. So basically what we're doing right now is uh, we've got some research on the International Space Station trying to understand um, how different microorganisms uh, can grow and how we can potentially turn these into, into food and pharmaceuticals. And then we have researchers back here on Earth, uh, which is some of the research that I'm getting into, trying to develop these organisms to be more resource efficient and to be more tasty uh, and to provide a, a great uh, diversity of, of flavors and textures uh, that we can actually eat. So something that you'd actually want to eat as opposed to just drinking an algae milkshake. Um, so this is one of, the, the, one of the reasons why we're really looking at, at space uh, and biology. And then the other one is we can just learn a lot from space biology by growing things in space. So here on Earth, as scientists, we try to control for as many variables as we can. So we've learned a lot about plants by controlling those variables, by, by either giving them too much water or not enough water and understanding how that, that makes them grow better or worse. We can do that with nutrients. We can do that with light. We can change all these variables. But one of the big variables that we cannot control for on Earth is gravity, right? So when, when scientists first uh, took some plants up to both the, uh, the space shuttles and the space station, they learn so much about plants that we never even knew here on Earth. Would, would even plants grow in space? Would, without gravity, would roots still go down and shoots still come up? So we've learned about how all the genetic changes in plants happen in microgravity in response to, uh, 
to radiation and to microgravity and to just living in a completely foreign environment. Um, how many of you guys know what tardigrades are? Yep, really cool little, little bug looking things that look like little water bears that swim around in the water in, in lichens. Um, those guys can actually survive in the vacuum of space. Now, if you, if you think about that, A, that's a really cool thing to be able to do, to be able to go outside the space station, to be able to, to sort of hunker down and stay alive in the vacuum of space with all sorts of radiation, with microgravity, um, with, with absolutely no air or water. Um, we can bring them back to Earth and they start swimming around again. That's really cool. What if we could take some of that, that biology, some of their genes or some of their proteins, uh, and actually engineer those into to organisms here on Earth to be able to make us uh, a bit more, either us or, or the things that we grow, either plants or microorganisms, um, to be able to, to actually be a little bit more stress resilient to, to things like, uh, like radiation. Um, so that's one of the, the cool things uh, that we've learned with, uh, with just bugs living on, on space station. Another kind of cool one um, is that bacteria actually become more virulent in microgravity. And we still don't know, under, understand exactly why, but there's definitely some genes that turn on in bacteria that make these bacteria more virulent. So that's something that's really important for both the, uh, the astronauts on the space station right now, but eventually when we have Martian and moon colonies, we want to make sure that we understand these things um, so that we can actually live and live well in microgravity. Um, so those are, those are just a few of the examples of, uh, of some of the experiments that we've done on station right now. So the space station has been populated. So we've had people on the International Space Station for two decades now. And we perform hundreds of biological experiments every year on the space station. So we've learned lots about plants, about microorganisms, and especially about humans. Because that's been one of the most interesting things for me is, is what have humans done? Uh, and how have we learned more about humans and how they live in microgravity? Because that's not a natural environment for us. Um, so we've learned about bone loss and muscle loss and loss of eyesight uh, in response to, to living in microgravity and living on the space station. And in response to learning that those things exist, we've learned how to mitigate those things. So we've learned how to understand um, how, how to prevent bone loss, how to prevent muscle loss, how, how starting to, we haven't quite figured it out yet, um, to, to start understanding how to mitigate eyesight loss uh, in response to microgravity and radiation. Um, so again, we've, we've learned all of these things and then we can take the things that we've learned on space station and in microgravity and apply those here on Earth as well. So even if all of us are never actually going to get to Mars, because it would be great if we all could, maybe, maybe some of the younger members of the audience will eventually get, uh, get to the space station, eventually get to Mars, but most of us will not be. But we can benefit from the things that we learn in space um, with, with living organisms in space and, uh, and learn about them here on Earth and, and to make life better here on Earth. Um, sort of just to, uh, to finish up, um, some of the really cool research that we're getting started here at UC right now um, is, is, like I said, space biology, something that I'm really excited about, uh, really excited about getting going. Um, it's a little bit different than whole organisms in space. So like I said, we've been doing biological experiments in space now for the last 20 years, and we've learned a lot of really cool things. And one of those things that we learned is about protein biochemistry. And so proteins basically make up the structures of our bodies. They do really important uh, jobs in our bodies. Uh, so basically the, the enzymes that are, that are in our mouths basically start help, help to break down uh, nutrients so we can actually absorb those into our systems. Um, these proteins and enzymes help us fight off infections. Basically proteins are really, really, really important for life, right? And one of the ways that we study proteins is with protein crystallography, right? Which sounds like a big mouthful, but it's actually not not too complicated. Basically, we take these proteins and we crystallize them, sort of like you'd crystallize salt or sugar. It's a little bit harder to do than crystallizing salt or sugar. Um, they're a little bit more complex molecules than, than sugar or salt. Um, but we crystallize them, and then we're able to use those protein crystals to get very specific structures of those proteins. So we can see exactly what they look like. And once we see exactly what those proteins look like, then we can then develop drug targets against these proteins um, we can, you know, understand disease better. We can understand all of life better by using these protein crystals. But like I said, getting protein crystals is a really difficult thing to do here on Earth. But what we found on station is we can actually get protein crystals much easier and get much better quality and much bigger protein crystals in microgravity. And so scientists have been studying these proteins in space for quite a while now. Uh, but for Kiwi researchers, it's quite difficult to get proteins to the International Space Station to crystallize them, right? But we just so happen to be the, the 13th country to have a launch facility. 
So we've got Rocket Lab here up on the North Island, and so we have the ability to actually send things into space. What we need is sort of an autonomous lab to be able to do this biology in space. And so what we've started doing, uh, we've formed a phenomenal team between University of Canterbury, uh, University of Auckland, and Arizona State, uh, State University. Um, so we're actually developing a satellite to crystallize these proteins in space. So we'll be able to take these proteins here from New Zealand, send them up into space, crystallize them, and eventually we'll be able to get them back and use them in our research here on Earth to create, like I said, better pharmaceuticals, better understanding of disease models, and better life here on Earth. So that's sort of what I've got today. Um, I hope you guys have learned a little bit about how space and biology can, can be intermixed, and how here at the University of Canterbury, uh, we're starting to do some of this fascinating research. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be around here for the next little bit, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you.